Why is it the baby in the family always gets the most attention? Well, there's a good reason for it, and we'll tell you why this week on Motoring 2002. SN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! You're looking at the famous corkscrew here at the Laguna Seca Racetrack in California. Now we're here this week because Nissan has chosen this track to allow automotive journalists to test drive the new Altima. Now I know what you're thinking. Are we talking that four-cylinder, four-door midsize sedan, 150 horses on a good day? Well, we are and we aren't. That does describe the old Altima. But this week we're checking out the new one. And as you're about to see, the new car has added some class as well as some attitude. The only thing uh, that is a carryover from the old Altima is the nameplate, uh, the name Altima. We've substantially increased the size of this car, matter of fact, to the level of a Camry or an Accord, or even close to today's Maxima from a size standpoint. Uh, in the past, we've only had a four-cylinder engine. Not only have we beefed up the engine on this car to a 180 horsepower four-cylinder, we're now offering for the first time ever for Altima a V6, and it's going to have a 240 horsepower engine in that. You don't get on shopping lists in many cases, even if people end up buying the four. Uh, you don't get on the shopping list if they, if they don't feel they have a choice. And they finally have a, a V6 in the uh, Altima. Three major things we heard back from consumers was, number one, they wanted a car with great styling. And uh, we've hit the nail on the head on that one. Number two, they wanted a roomy car. And that was one of the areas we were not delivering totally on in, with the past Altima. This car is substantially larger than what our previous Altima is. And the third thing they were looking for was performance, which you may have heard a little bit of right there. We are at a racetrack, and it's performance. So we came out with the two engines, uh, uh, 180 horsepower and 240 horsepower, which are class leading size engines. It's a big, big car for the company, uh, not just in terms of our volume expectations, which are large at 190,000 units, but it's really important for any company to have a real strong entry in the middle sedan market. And this uh, new uh, Altima was developed to be uh, just that. This car was targeted to be better than the next generation cars of our competition in size, in performance, uh, and in styling. We feel very good that we've accomplished our goals. The only way to pick up numbers is to steal numbers from somebody else. And that's where, of any group of car companies in North America, the domestics are the most vulnerable. Most domestic manufacturers don't make anything on their cars to speak of. They make most of their profits on trucks. Look at this Ultima that we're testing now. This car is, is light years ahead of virtually any product offered in that segment by the domestic manufacturer. So I don't expect Nissan to pick up share from Honda or Toyota. I do expect them to pick up share from the domestics. You know what, domestic market, uh, uh, there's a very large number, obviously, of uh, people in domestic cars today. When we, when we have looked at the marketplace for us and where we want to target, it's square on with Camry and Accord. We hope to get as many domestic uh, owners as well. Are you worried about this car cannibalizing Maxima? No, we're not worried about it cannibalizing Maxima. We've developed the two cars to uh, uh, appeal to different uh, buyers. The Maxima is uh, more luxurious, uh, much more refined, has a much uh, higher level of uh, standard uh, luxury features. Uh, Altima, on the other hand, is uh, lighter, uh, nimbler, uh, less uh, refined kind of a feeling, but very sporty. So we're very confident that the two cars are uh, quite different and that there are really different uh, customer preferences uh, for them. 
I think they may be right that they can hold most of that maximum volume. They're willing to give, remember, they're willing to give up a lot of that maximum volume. They're expecting that um, because they're taking down the uh, low end of maxima down, or, you know, with a 5%. So they're willing to give that up because that wasn't particularly profitable anyway. Mm -hmm. If they can sell high end altimas as opposed to low end maximas, that's a money making deal. My anticipation is they would like to grow Ultima into the 300,000 unit a year range from about 190,000, which is what they're predicting. And they would like to see Maxima go away as it is in its current form and morph into some other kind of even more profitable vehicle. That's the challenge. This new BMW 7 Series could change the world. But is that a good thing? More later on Kenzie's Corner. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at Kia's most important new product. This is the all-new Sedona minivan. For Kia to solidify its place in Canada, it needed a model that played in the mainstream market. While the Sportage Mini Ute does, it lacks the luster to appeal to a broader audience. The Sedona minivan, on the other hand, brings the right ingredients, primarily because it has the wherewithal to compete in a busy and very tough segment. Take the engine for example, the 3.5 litre double overhead cam V6 delivers 195 horsepower at 5500 RPM and a decent 218 pounds feet of torque at 35. The net result is spirited performance across a broad range. Running to 100 km an hour takes 10.5 seconds while the all important 80 to 120 passing move, it clocks in at about 8 seconds. This engine is also surprisingly smooth and quiet even at full chat. You know, you really do appreciate all the power under the hood of this Sedona, especially if you use the van to capacity, either for passengers or for cargo. However, it does have a drawback. It loves to spin these tires when you're on wet tarmac. The result, this van suffers from torque steer. Now that's where one wheel grips momentarily before the other, jerking it in that direction. The problem is, from a driver's perspective, you don't know which way it's gonna go. Now while it's really not a big deal, you should keep both hands on the wheel. Some form of traction control system would counter this trait. That aside, the other part of the powertrain is a slick five-speed automatic transmission that comes with an on-off switch for the overdrive. The advantage of the five speeds is that there's a ratio for just about every eventuality. First is low enough to launch the van with authority, while fifth is tall enough to bring 100 kilometers an hour at less than 2,000 RPM. This makes for a very leisurely highway cruise. You know, if you go with the EX version of this new Sedona, you get one very nicely appointed van. To begin with, the leather that's used on the seating doesn't look like it should have been used for gardening gloves. You also get all of the power items, a good sound in radio, plus a couple of other neat features. First of all, this tray folds down and also extends rearward to give the back passengers a couple of cup holders. Then you've got this little black box on the windshield. Now what it does, it monitors the amount of moisture on the windshield and wipes the wipers for you automatically. You don't have to touch them. And it works all the way from a slow sweep to full tilt. Just remember to turn them off when you go through the car wash. I forgot. Riding on McPherson struts and an anti-roll bar up front and a five-link design in back, the Sedona leans towards the ride side of the equation, quite literally. Through the pylons, the amount of roll is very evident, although once the body takes a set, the van is as good as most will ever need. Understeer, however, is a factor in spite of the grip from the 215-70 R15 tires. The steering, however, is good, featuring enough weight and a fairly fast response to driver input. Brakes work on discs up front and drums in back. Thankfully, anti-lock is available on the EX model. When so equipped, the stops are straight, measuring just 117 feet from 80K. The pedal feel is firm and the effort needed balanced. 
As far as versatility is concerned, this Sedona has been fairly well thought through as there's no fewer than eight different seating configurations. However, they forgot the most important one, and the reason is simple. The two seats at the back that form a three-seat bench cannot be moved forward into the center position, primarily because the mounting points don't fit. Therefore, if you've got three kids, two adults, and a load of luggage, well, you've only got two choices. Either leave one of the kids at home, or take the center seats out, load the three people in the back, and the luggage right here. Now, that's hardly a wise idea, considering that all of that luggage well, it's unrestrained. Quibbles aside, the Sedona brings plenty of space. With all seats in place, you get 21.8 cubic feet. Pull the lot out, which does require a little muscle, and this number grows to 127.5. On the safety front, the Sedona gets height adjustable seat belts in the first and second rows, dual front airbags, and childproof door locks on both sliding doors. You know, in spite of my criticisms, this new minivan is going to have a huge impact on the market, primarily because A, it's a good one, and B, it's very attractively priced. In short, if the mainstay competition don't watch the back door, this thing could slip through and challenge them for sales supremacy. This tip of the week concerns the reserve capacity built into your vehicle's battery. It's always given in the spec chart, but rarely talked about. And reserve capacity is the ability of the battery to deliver approximately 20 amps of current, which would be required to keep the engine running, the heaters, wiper, and defroster going in the event of an electrical emergency on your car. For example, the alternator quits working on your vehicle with the reserve capacity built into the battery. You could still drive the vehicle off the road to a safe location where it could be repaired. Now, and this vehicle, for example, three different sizes of batteries could typically be fitted into this vehicle, and all of them would have enough cranking power to start this engine in sub-zero weather. But the smallest battery might have as little as 75 minutes of reserve capacity, and the biggest one, this one right here, might have as many as 115 minutes of reserve capacity. It's that reserve capacity that could run your four ways if you broke down on the side of the road or allow you to sit somewhere with the ignition on accessory, not wasting fuel and listen to the radio and still have the wipers working, for example. That reserve capacity is what's going to allow you to run those accessories and still restart the vehicle. The better the battery and the bigger the battery, the more reserve capacity. That's your Midas tip of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been waiting for this day for a long time. I'm pleased and very excited to introduce the next big thing in sports car, the Mazda RX-8. These days we're uh, putting concept cars together not just for design exercise, but in actuality using it to determine how it's going to drive our future product strategy. And what we learned last year when we showed this vehicle at Tokyo and then Detroit is that there was a tremendous swell of customer goodwill for the RX name. Uh, in addition, we presented a new concept, a four-door sports car, uh, and the reaction was outstanding. Customers basically said, when can I order one? This contains our next generation, what we call Renesis rotary engine. Uh, it's going to produce 250 horsepower at uh, 8,500 RPM. Uh, but one of the real key things, in addition to the engine, is the 50-50 weight distribution in the vehicle. And what that means for the customer is that the ride and handling is very stable, so that when you're going through a curve at very high rates of speed, the vehicle stays stable. The rear end doesn't fishtail out, so it's a very fun-to-drive vehicle. This vehicle is going to be very important not only from a sales standpoint, but from an image standpoint as well. What you see here today is uh, not a fully approved program yet, but I would expect within the next six months we'll get this vehicle program approved and then within the next two years you'll see this vehicle on the street.
We're back at the Laguna Seca racetrack in California. You know, this track is home to the kart series, and as well, it's home to the Skip Barber Racing School, of which some of the students are out there right now. They obviously have more money and more time in their hands than yours truly. Anyway, I know one man who would love to be out here, and that's our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner. Brad, I'd like to be there for a couple of things. The weather and driving those race cars around Laguna Seca would be a lot of fun, I'm sure. Anyhow, those race cars, Brad, probably don't use air filters. Most race cars don't use them for the simple fact that they offer a little bit of restriction to the engine. They hurt power slightly, but they do a lot for your passenger car light truck in terms of keeping grit and dirt from entering the engine and wearing your engine out. Now, there's two styles of air filters that are commonly used in today's cars. Now, I'll take the wing nut off and we'll have a look at the older style of air filter that this vehicle uses. It's a pleated paper filter in a cylindrical fashion and by pleating the paper it gives you a lot of filtering surface area in a minimum amount of space. Now all the dirt should be either in the filter or on the outboard side of the filter. If you ever see dirt inboard of the filter you've either got the wrong filter or a torn or defective air filter. Now let's go over to the other vehicle and have a look at the second style. Most late model vehicles use a panel type air filter. This Suzuki has four little clasps to keep the two sides of the air cleaner housing together and you're going to see why they call it a panel when I take it out. It's because of the shape of it. Now this is the clean side of the air filter. You can see that no dirt has gotten past it but when I flip it over you can see that this, this filter has already stopped lots of dirt from entering the engine. Here it is trapped up here on the filter media. Now on a good quality filter you'll have a nice seal around the outside and a certain amount of rigidity to the filter itself so that when you put it in there it's going to fit and sit properly in the bottom half of the air cleaner housing and these soft seals will prevent any dirt from getting past it. Now in some vehicles instead of the filter sitting horizontal like this it'll sit on its edge or vertical. If you've got a vehicle like that, when you take the filter out for inspection, be very careful that any grit that was in the filter didn't fall down and get ingested into your engine when you restart it. Every time you take a filter out that's on its edge, you should take a shop back and clean the lower half of the housing of this dirt and grit that you see in here. You don't want it to get drawn back in the engine when you restart it. Now with the panel type air filters like the Suzuki uses, you usually won't have fit problems but you may have problems with the filter if you don't get a good quality one in terms of its rigidity and the seals around the edge. Now on the cylindrical type air filters it's a different story. The other day we had a customer bring a, a used vehicle in that uh, had piston rings that were worn out. We were trying to figure out why until we got to the air filter and we found that he had the incorrect air filter. The one in my right hand was in his vehicle. The one in my left hand is the one it should have had and you can see the difference in the height. Now when I put them together like this, you can see that the diameter was bang on, but that height was the problem. So that inch of height that he was missing off the filter allowed unfiltered air to bypass the filter, go right into the engine, and wear out the piston rings in only 150,000 K. Now we happen to know that in this particular vehicle, the engines are typically lasting three to 400,000 kilometers, and sometimes more if they have good filtration. So it's very important that you get the right filter and a quality one. Now in many cases, the right part number for the filter is written right on the housing, or it's in your owner's manual, or you can get a parts guy to look up the correct filter for you, but don't match up with what came out, or you may duplicate the problem. And that's probably the problem that our customer had with his vehicle. One guy made a mistake early on in its life, and then successive service people just matched up against the wrong air filter and kept putting the wrong one in there. On these cylindrical types, that's easy to happen because you can see how the diameters are very similar but heights are different. So make sure you're getting a quality air filter installed correctly and check that fit. Make sure you get the right one. It's very important. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002. Quite obviously, this is a BMW. It's got the rondelle on the front, it's got your twin kidney grill, but trust me, this is like no BMW you've ever seen. It's the new 7 Series, and it's got stuff inside here that's going to boggle your mind. For starters, that's the key. Notice there's nothing sticking out of there. There is no key to this car. It's all electronic. You stick it in the slot, and if you push this button, it turns on the ignition. If you have your foot on the pedal and you push the button, it starts the car. That's pretty cool. Push the button again, 
the engine shuts off. But what really makes this car different is something called iDrive. Now this is a system BMW's designed to try and figure out how to handle all the functions that people want in an automobile without cluttering the dashboard with too many buttons. Well, you can might say they've already failed there, but never mind. If you push this little lever like that, you come up with a menu that tells you a number of different things. If you push the button forward, it goes to communication, your telephone system. Pull it backward, it switches on entertainment. Push it this way, it goes to the climate menu. Then you rotate this little knob, and you can see the box flying around to different functions. Set the seat temperature. The car's got electric seats. It's even got air-conditioned seats. And you push what you want. You push the button down. It's all done for you. Except I'm doing all this while I'm stationary. What's it like to drive? Well, to tell you the truth, I can't tell you because I can't figure out how to release the parking brake because that's done with a separate button over here. I'm just kidding. We did drive the car yesterday. It is quite fantastic. A fabulous engine, wonderful chassis, a lot of electronics in both the engine and the transmission and the suspension. There's gadgets everywhere. But the only button that's really easy to work, well, that's this one right here. You push it and you turn on the radio. Now there is a concept. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, the Maxima is celebrating its 21st birthday. It's been a workhorse and a profitable car for Nissan. But a lot of the talk out here at the launch of the Altima among journalists has been that there's a possibility the Altima, classier, more powerful, could cannibalize sales from Maxima. Well, Nissan doesn't seem to be concerned. They believe the Altima will attract new customers, in particular from Honda and Toyota. So they don't see it as a problem. You know, when you consider the problems this company has had in the past, having two cars battling it out in the showroom for best in show, well, that's a problem most car makers would like to have. First impressions on the vehicle, they've hit a bullseye. But Graham will have a closer look on a future test drive. Make sure you join us for that as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. We look at this car with a bit of a tear in our eye to wave goodbye to it, you know, because it's been such a crucial part of our success. The nice thing about the new A4, I think, will appeal to even a broader range of customers than the outgoing A4 did. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas!